Thank you, Lord. Amen. You can be seated in Jesus' name as our ushers make their way this morning. No major announcements, just a reminder. Tonight we will be having Sunday night service here and online. So if you would like to come tonight, we'd love to see you in person. And if not, we'd love to have you online to join us. So please remember that tonight at 630. Let's ask the Lord to bless this offering. Thank you, Jesus, for this opportunity. Give to your kingdom. I pray right now that you would bless it and multiply it. Bless every giver in this place today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So happy for you guys, and we are so blessed to have both of you as individuals and as a couple to this church, and we wish you 40 more years and blessed marriage, and pray that God continues to bless you. So let's give one more hand for the Hyde Walls. Happy anniversary. Praise God. Thank you very much, and thank you for the flowers that we received at the house yesterday, and 40 years is... I started to say, say it sounds like a lifetime, seems like a lifetime, but hey man, I want to thank God for my wife and say happy anniversary to her, and uh, she is a uh, trooper, and she's tremendous, loves the kingdom of God, loves you as the church, and uh, so we uh, are grateful for you, so. Thank you for those well wishes. We want to also, I want to mention again about Brother Spencer. And uh, uh, we were finally able to see him Thursday when he got home and, and was put in hospice care. We were able to go and pray for him and be with him for a little while. He was not conscious, but it was just nice to be able to be there and, and, and pray for him and, and just kind of talk with those that were there about his life and and uh, uh, how he loved the Lord and served him in his quiet way, in his quiet way, amen, very uh, private person, uh, very quiet, you, you wouldn't see him get all excited and run aisles and stuff like that, but you would see him raise his hands and cry and, and pray and just uh, was a very, uh, uh, very involved in, in his relationship with Jesus Christ. And so that makes things a whole lot better, amen, when you know somebody's life. First Samuel, the 13th chapter, <clears throat> verse 20, here in the uh, book of First Samuel 13, you're going to find a storyline of uh, Israel that was going through a time of distress and uh, Saul gets impatient and usurps the authority, or the office I should say of the priest in offering up sacrifices. Uh, Samuel didn't show up and so he thought he'd take things in his own hand. And then finally when Samuel gets there in this story, you'll read where Samuel reproves uh, Saul for his actions. <clears throat> now in giving you that little synopsis of what this chapter is all about, I just want to pull verse 20 out 
of 1 Samuel 13 this morning. And let's read together. But all the Israelites went down to the Philistines to sharpen every man his share and his coulter. The Latin word for coulter is basically a knife or a plowed share. In other words, they sharpened those things up and cut the ground. So he, uh, to sharpen every man his share, his coulter, and his axe and his mattock. Amen. So today we want to talk a little bit about life. And sometimes we find ourselves in uncertain places or a place of uncertainty. And uh, that's a very dangerous place to be at, is a place of uncertainty. So let's pray today and ask God this morning to just bless us, amen, with his word once again. Lord God, we thank you today, amen, for your goodness, your mercy, your loving kindness that you have so graciously shown to us. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity once again to get into your word. And Lord, we pray, God, for, amen, our nation, and pray, God, that you would uh, bring healing to our land and healing to our hearts. Amen. I pray, God, that you would bless, amen, our leadership and our, our leaders in our cities and our councils and our governors and our, those that are in Congress and, and that, uh, fill, that uh, fill many high positions in our land. And I pray, God, that you would help us as a people, as your people, amen, to even though we live in uncertain times, we have a certain God. And I pray, God, that you would bless us today. Amen. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray. And let everybody say amen. Praise God. God bless you. You may be seated. So uh, when you look at uncertainty, uncertainty is one of the most challenging of all, of, uh, of all human problems to have uh, to contend with. Uh, because it is a place uh, considered being somewhere in the middle. Everybody say the middle. And so you have traveled too far from the start, but not far enough to get to your destination. Amen. How many's ever been in the middle of somewhere? How many's ever heard of the expression in the middle of nowhere? Amen. Have you ever heard that? How many's ever been out? You started for some place, but somewhere in the middle, all of a sudden your car quits or you get stuck out there in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of uncertainty. Amen. So, uh, you know, we've started, but we haven't finished. And that is, that is a place of, <clears throat> of, uh, uh, of, of uh, if I could say it this way, it's a deadly place. Being in the middle of uncertainty. Have you ever been in that place of uncertainty? Have you ever been in a place where it just seems like you couldn't, you couldn't get a firm foundation to stand on? Everything was kind of shaky, nothing was solid. Have you ever been in a place where you weren't certain how the next day was going to turn out? Have you ever been in a place where you didn't know where the next house payment was going to come from? Car payment was going to come from? Your energy bill was going to come from? Your groceries were going to come from? Have you ever been in a place where hope has been crushed and faith has fled? Have you ever been in a place where uncertainty had pushed you to a place of panic? Don't know what I'm going to do now. I don't have the resources. I, I don't know. I don't, I don't have anything to draw from or whatever the situation might be. Uh, it's caused you to begin to panic because you don't have an answer to your uncertainty. Uncertainty has a way of unnerving most of us. Uncertainty actually can bring us to a place of paralysis many times. You won't live very long until you come to understand that a, a lot of people living in this world live in a place of uncertainty. But the reality is that most of us don't want the vulnerability that might blow our cover. So we cover our uncertainty with a pretense that says everything is okay. Everything's well. How are you doing today? Oh, it's great. But yet you've covered it up. It's not so great. Amen. How's things going today? Wonderful. How are you doing? But yet at the same time, 
really it's not all there. It's not all a part of it. Amen. How many have ever been there before? All of us, I believe, have been there at some point or another in our life. And so we spend time talking about different things. We'll avoid what we're uncertain about and we'll talk about the weather. How's the weather today? Amen. Is it going to rain? Is it going to storm? Amen. We'll enter into those kind of conversations. How's the economy? Man, did you see the price of gas? Amen. Or some, some, some inane thing or, or empty thing to cover uh, the uncertainty that is in the soul. Listen to me on this Sunday morning. We got a lot of uncertainty going on in the world today where we don't know what's going to happen from one day to the next. <clears throat> Amen. We, we uh, have masks that they ask us to wear. Why? Because they are uncertain about what is happening uh, uh, in different quarters of our society. Uh, Amen. We have all the different things that you and I face uh, on a daily basis. We just don't know what's going to happen from day to day. All the unrest, uh, amen, where people, a lot of hurt and pain that's going on, but yet they don't know what the the certainty of things are. It's the uncertain things that overload them. Amen. Overloaded with the life, but managed to keep up the front that seemingly says that all is well. I'll use an example like this. It's like when I go to a restaurant, they used to come, and I used this before, but I like to use this analogy. Uh, when, they go to, when I go to a restaurant and they come up after you finish your meal and, and the lady or the young man says to you, uh, would you like any dessert? And I used to say, no, I don't want any dessert. Then I got to thinking some, one day, I said, you know what? That's really not truthful. I always want dessert. How many knows what I'm talking about? I always want dessert, and so I had to turn that around. And when they asked me, would you like dessert, I would always say yes, but I can't have it, or I'm going to pass. I want the dessert, but I'm making the conscious decision that I don't, want, I don't need it right now, right? Amen. And so in life, we kind of do that. We kind of we just make those excuses. We'll just carte blanche come up and say, uh, yeah, everything's cool. Everything's all right. It's wonderful. It's peachy in my life. I have nothing to worry about. But in reality, it's a front. It's a front. It's like I was talking to Brother Howard earlier about masks. Amen. Amen. And so I was talking about how that people that talk with me with a mask on, uh, I was having a conversation with somebody and that conversation went probably about 10 minutes. And as we were conversing in the conversation uh, and they were talking to me, all I did was this. And I'd smile. Didn't have a clue what they were saying. I would just smile and then just kind of check it in like, yeah, yeah, yeah but didn't know a word that they were saying. Somebody else was talking to me one night at the altar, and I kept leaning down, leaning down, leaning down, just trying to pick up what they were saying. Why? You say, well, Pastor, why is that a necessity? Because you, what you don't realize, my hearing's not all that good. So when I'm talking to you, I'm looking at your lips, and I'm trying to pick up what you're saying. So when you got a mask on, and I start doing this, just say, Pastor, you don't understand what I'm saying, do you? And I'm going to go, no. But we put these fronts on. We can smile. We can, we can acknowledge. We can, we can respond in a way that, that, that makes people feel like everything is okay. But in reality, we're not, we're not where we're saying we're at. And so here in 1 Samuel, our text, verse 13, chapter, uh, chapter 13, verse 20, the text that we read is uh, an isolated passage in the midst of great uncertainty for the uh, children of Israel. And they had been reduced to a place of great uh, degradation and, and depression because of their sin. For you see in the story, the Philistines uh, had gained a great victory over Eli and his sons. And they had possession now of the Ark of the Covenant. And Israel was now in a state of great uncertainty. The Ark meant everything to them. That was the place uh, that was in the tabernacle and 
and the power of God, the Shekinah glory of God would come down and rest on that, between the cherubims, on that seat, that mercy seat, that ark, uh, on that ark of the covenant. And Israel was now in a place of uncertainty. And it's, it's troubling to be in a place of great uncertainty when you, when you have made uh, some bad choices in your life. Amen. But it seems to be compounded when all of the supports and the support that are associated with God have now been violated and taken from you. You don't have them. That was their case. That ark meant everything to them. Even though they weren't living the way they were, the ark still gave them hope. The ark still gave them a motivation to fight for the things of God. Amen. Even though they were, were, were you know, uh, not where they should have been, amen, the ark still represented something. It represented the power of God amongst them. But now that the ark is gone, they have uncertainty. What do they lean on? What do they hope for? What, what can they believe in anymore? And so this is where Israel ended up. Much uncertainty had brought them to this place. You see, you can read previously in the chapter, like I referenced before, where Saul had come along and gathered uh, a measly 600 men to fight off the ravages of uh, the Philistines. And, and consider the number of, of, of uh, the Philistine army. Uh, when you read it here in the Scripture in verse 5, it's pretty... Uh, Crazy. They had 30,000 chariots. They had 6,000 horsemen. Amen. The people, it says, numbered like the sand of the seashore. So they had so, so much people arrayed in battle. And this is quite an amazing number, amen, to have to fight against, especially with what you had. And the Bible goes on to say that the children of Israel were in a strait, in a strait. In other words, they were in danger. And they became distressed and began to hide in the caves and among the rocks, uh, amen, for the fear uh, of, of their lives. And some even fled the land and left that tiny army that they had amassed <clears throat> to fend for themselves. In fact, when you read, in, uh, read this uh, uh, sixth verse in the NIV, it renders it this way. It says, when the men of Israel saw that their situation was critical and that their army was hard-pressed, they hid in caves and thickets among the rocks and in pits and in cisterns. Amen. When, when they saw their situation was critical, when they were in a place where they didn't know what to do, they were in danger, they were in a strait. As the uncertainty mounts, King Saul, who is in a state of great impatience and uncertainty, wanting to hear a word from God, could not wait on the prophet Samuel, and so he panics to the extent that he usurps his position and offers a sacrifice unto God because the prophet had not showed up yet to do it. But because of that single act, because of his impatience, because he as a, a, a king thought that he could fulfill the role of a priest, because of this, you find where God now has rejected Saul as the king of Israel. And you would read once again in 1 Samuel 15 and verse 26 where Saul once again did it again. You see, folks, let me tell you something right now. Impatience will get you into a place of uncertainty. Panic will get you into a place of uncertainty. That's what comes out of it. And impatience with God's plan and uncertainty about the conditions will push people, amen, into actions of dis disobedience that they may have never performed before. That, and so that occurrence is not limited to Saul, but it is limited also to you and I in our day and time. When we get to the place to where we lack the patience and we feel like we can do it on our own, Amen. You and I will find out very quickly, uh, amen, that the hand of God will be against us just as well. 
Hey, folks, it is fear. It is, it, is, it is terrible to fall in the hands of a fearful God. You have to understand that God, I think about this often about the children of Israel and even in our day and time, how even to this day many of them reject God in that sense uh, and they reject Him. And I'm thinking, man, how many times have you read your history? How many times have you went back, uh, amen, and read how that the children of Israel turned their back on God and yet often over and over again you would just put yourself in a place where God would reject you or God would put His hand against you. Think about that today, my friends. God is not limited. God is not limited by the failures of you and I. No. No. Somebody say, praise the Lord. You know, the one good thing about the, uh, the, about the failings of Israel, God was going to step into the midst of their uncertainty and use their enemy to sharpen their weapons. Isn't it amazing how God will come in, step in, and he will, he will, he will do a work, a great work for them. Because God is God. God don't change. God's got the answer. God, God's, God's got all the wisdom. God's got all the knowledge. Makes no difference what you and I are facing. God can just speak a word. God can usher in his presence. It makes no difference. We just need to just count and wait on God. Don't become impatient. God's got the answer. God's got the message. So God's going to step in. And if God be for us, who can be against us, right? Amen. Right. Hey when God steps in, it makes no difference what kind of uh, battle is waging right now. We could be losing the battle. We could be losing the war. But when God steps in, everything's going to change. Right. right? Come on. Somebody say hallelujah. Right. Everything's going to change. God, God makes a difference when he shows up. Right. Oh, let's clap our hands and praise him this morning. So it's critical for us to remember that God is never limited by the failures of men. Story here, one of Denmark's leading sculptors had a consuming ambition to sculpt the greatest statue of Jesus Christ ever made. And so he began the painstaking shaping a clay model of triumphant, majestic figure. He said, this is going to be a masterpiece he stated on the day the model was completed. However, during the night, there was a heavy fog that set in the area and the sea spray began to seep into the sculptor's studio through a window that was partially open. In the morning, as he went back and looked at his model, he was shocked. Amen. The droplets of the moisture had formed on the statue. Created, it created the illusion of bleeding. The head drooped, the facial expression had melted into compassion. The arms drooped and expressed welcome. The artist was horrified and was aghast at having to, to start all over again. But as he kept looking at the statue of the Savior, his thoughts began to take a different shape. He realized that this image of Christ was much closer to reality. He then wrote his caption and placed it under the figure, Come unto me in truth as he had initially desired though not in the manner he had envisioned it this divinely altered piece of art was in fact his masterpiece you see that has happened more than just with the sculpture it's happened more often than we could count in Pentecostal experiences all over the world because what the devil meant for evil, God meant it for good. Somebody say, praise the Lord. What the devil meant for evil, God meant it for good. And so God will take the enemy and he will use them for his purpose. When you read the Bible, the Bible is full of examples where the Lord took the enemy and used them for his purpose. One comes to mind, one that we read about hopefully often is Joseph being prepared in captivity to save people. Hallelujah. You find another, another one by the name of Moses that was hidden in an ark made out of bulrushes. What was his whole divine purpose? Uh, to save people. 
Israel going down into Egypt and basically incubating there for all of those years, amen, until, until God, amen, the purpose was fulfilled. And even though it was hard sometimes when God made it happen, great things came from it. Another story of David fleeing with his life, for his life, with his life from Saul. Why is that? Saul tried to take it, but God had a mission for David. Saul tried to take his life, but God had anointed his life. Hello? Come on, let me, let me tell you something this morning. It makes no difference where you're at. Just understand God knows where you're at. God sees you where you're at. Amen. God knows what's going on in your life. And even though you might be in that middle or a place of uncertainty, let your faith still be in God. Let your hope still be in Him. Still talk to Him knowing that He knows where you're at, what's going on. He's got a plan. He's got a purpose. And no matter what's coming against you, God can change that for good. Oh, let's clap our hands and praise Him this morning. You see, that's what Paul summed up in the book of Ephesians, the second chapter. Let me read it to you this morning. Verses 1 through 7, Paul was talking to them and he said, And you hath he quickened uh, who were dead in trespasses and sin. How many understands that before you came to Christ, you were dead in your sins? Amen. Somebody say, praise the Lord. He said, where in time past you walked according to the course of this world. This world, folks, I'm going to tell you right now, we have to be determined not to walk in the course of this world. This world is headed in the wrong direction. This world is, is headed for damnation and, and, and they're headed for uh, destruction. Uh, amen. I do not want to go that direction. Uh, I want to turn around and go the direction, uh, amen, that God has laid out before me. I'm not going to walk according to the course of this world, according to the prince and the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sin, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places uh, in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches uh, of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Uh, amen. Oh, let me tell you something this morning. When you read a scripture like that you understand uh, if we follow the word of God we're going up. Amen. We're going up. Come on, when you, when you repent of your sins uh, and you go down in a watery grave for the remission of your sins uh, in the name of Jesus Christ uh, and you're filled with, a, uh, with the Spirit of God, amen, your destiny changes, uh, amen, you change course, uh, amen, you go in the opposite direction, uh, amen, you're going uh, to a place that God has prepared for you, uh, not a place that's prepared for those that don't serve God. You see, Jesus gave us a faint idea of what, uh, of that with, uh, with his miracles, when he talked about his miracles. You see, water, the first miracle, water being turned into wine. You know, the thing about it is, about, about, about that story to me and about other stories, is the simple fact that, that, that God can take uh, your emptiness and he could fill it up was something spectacular, right? He can take what just seems to be plain water and just change it into wine. He can take your life that just seems like blasé, plain, nothing really going on, and all of a sudden make something spectacular out of it, right? How many wants that for your life? Blind Bartimaeus! Here's a man that that, 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 that was blind. He had no vision. Amen. But yet God came into his life. And God is the one 
that corrected his blindness. Amen. Changed that blindness and brought vision to blind Bartimaeus. That changed his life. You see, when God comes into your life, he changes you. Right? Paul said old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. Right? He changes your life. He doesn't leave you the same way he found you. And if that's the case in your life, then you need to reevaluate some things and say, you know what? I, ha I haven't really been changed like God wants to change me. And begin to make the things, the necessary changes in your life through the power of Jesus Christ that will get you on the right track. Oh, let's clap our hands and praise Him again this morning. The miracle of the deaf ears being opened. Awesome. Awesome. Awesome that they were, were healed and could walk away that moment. Their life was changed from a life of silence to now hearing all the different sounds and the different things, uh, the construction and the birds and people talking, uh, amen, people walking on the streets and the ground and everything else become alive in them because before it was just silence. All they could do was see, but now they could hear. Amen. When I think about that, uh, the deaf being healed, uh, being healed, uh, it's not it's not only in the in the sense of the natural, but I, I I thank God that we have it in the spiritual. Because Amen. When we come to God, we're not hearing truth. We're not hearing uh, what what uh, uh, what the Word of God has for us. We're deaf, spiritually deaf. But yet there's the Spirit of God when it begins to move and it touches our life through conviction, uh, and our ears are open and we begin for the first time hearing truth uh, and hearing the Word of God as it brings life into our bodies hallelujah amen so I pray today that we don't become deaf in the spirit but I pray that our ears are open in the spirit that we can hear what thus saith the Lord in our lives read all the characters of the gospel there's story after story after story after story about the move of God in somebody's life that changed, radically changed their lives radically changed their lives. Amen. I, I, yeah, there's no better uh, description of that than Paul. Amen. When he was Saul, Saul of Tarsus that was out to destroy the church and the Christians and even at the point where they put their cloak at the feet of Saul when they stoned Stephen to death. But yet God had purpose and God said, I can use this guy. Amen. I can use him. And so therefore God in the midst, in the middle, getting to Damascus, God met him there on the road. And that's when Paul's life began to change. Oh, let me tell you something today. We've got to be willing to get there. I want that change. Amen, because sometimes when we come to the darkest times of our life, when we become at, at that point where everything seems to be collapsing and falling in on us, uh, amen, that's when we need to lift up our hands and our voice and our eyes and say, God, amen, it might be, uh, it might be uncertain right now in my life, but I know you're not uncertain. Uh, amen, I know you're a certain God. Uh, I know you're a God that moves and answers and touches. Uh, amen, I know you're a God that can change situations. Uh, amen, and put your faith and hope and trust in Him. Amen, and let God deal with it. Because there was a dark time that came. It was a place called Calvary. It was at that place called Calvary that Jesus laid down his life. And that body became a sacrifice. It was at that place called Calvary that he took on the sins of the world. It was at that place called Calvary, amen, that now gives you and I hope that we can also be that new creature in Christ Jesus. That that old life can just kind of dissipate and fall away. Amen. Here, let me tell you, that's what Christianity is all about. That's what Christ-like is being all about. I know we're human. I know sometimes our human nature is to cling to some of the things that we hold on to them. We don't want to turn loose to them. We don't want to let them go. And that's, that's what, that's what our, our humanity says. Uh, amen. But there's got to come a time to where you say, you know what? I, my flesh, I'm going to turn loose of that stuff and let God have complete control in my life. Because really, ultimately, in the end, that's all that really matters. 
right? Oh, somebody say praise the Lord. Calvary. Darkest time, I believe, in, our, in the history of humanity. Now Jesus is dead. Now you really have incredible, an incredible amount of uncertainty. Wouldn't you feel that way as a, as a, uh, a disciple or a follower of Christ? Uh, if everything you believed in for that three and a half years or his family that had been around him for his whole life, amen, and all of a sudden now it was nailed to a cross and he, and he gives up the ghost and he passes there and they got to take him and bury him in a borrowed tomb. He's dead. Incredible uncertainty. Let me ask you again. Have you ever been there? Have you ever been there? The uncertainty of limited resources. The uncertainty of disability. The uncertainty of a bad marriage or a nagging illness. A job loss, financial pressure. Uncertainty of troubled children. Uncertainty of consequences from bad choice. The uncertainty of providing care to someone you love. The uncertainty of darkness that will not seem to lift. The uncertainty of questions that will not let you rest. The uncertainty of not having anyone that you can lean on. The uncertainty of seeing a dream collapse before it ever had a chance to walk. The uncertainty of a dilemma that you did not ask for. Have you ever been there? See, this is what my faith locks in on. Even though Calvary, Brother Greg, was the darkest time, amen, all, all of a sudden, Jesus said, you know what? He tried to tell him before, I'm not going to stay in that ground. It's going to be a short period of time. It's going to let me accomplish what I need to accomplish. And I'm going I'm to get back up. I'm going to rise again. You see, folks, your faith, your hope, your trust has got to be in a Savior that can get up. A Savior that not only died and was put in the ground, but got up. There was resurrection power. Hallelujah. Amen. You can, you can believe in a lot of stuff, but my, my, my argument to you is, amen, did they ever get back up once they died? Did they ever come back to life once they died? Or are they still in the ground? Are they still there and thousands and millions of people believe on something that is never resurrected, but yet we have a king that has resurrected, a savior that has resurrected. A man took the sins on the world upon his shoulders. A man went to Calvary, went through all of that judgment and punishment, and yet rose again so that you and I might experience that in our salvation. Do you believe that today? That's the good news, folks. The good news is he, he has risen. He has risen. Just like he said. Let me tell you what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15. Verse 20 to 22. I'm, I'm going to wrap this up here in a minute. But now as Christ risen from the dead, notice, and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man come, came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die. Turn to your neighbor right now if they're far enough away from you or if it's your wife or husband and say, that's your destiny. <laughs> Amen. That is our destiny. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Hallelujah. Amen. In Adam we die, in Christ we live. Let me say it again. In Adam we die, but in Christ we live. In Adam we die, but in Christ we live. In this flesh that we have, we die, but in Christ we live. 
Amen. Why, why do you say about that? Because I know what's going to happen uh, in the end. Uh, amen. If I go by way of the grave, there's going to be a quickening of my spirit in the day when the trump of God sounds. Uh, amen. I'm going to read about it here. Notice what it says uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 to 58. Behold, Paul said, I'll show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised. What? Come on, shout it real loud. Incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. So, when this corruptible shall put on incorruption, and this mortal shall put on immortality, then shall be uh, brought to pass the saying that is written, uh, amen, death is swallowed up in victory. Uh, oh, death, where is thy sting? Uh, oh, grave, where is thy victory? Uh, the sting of death is sin, uh, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory uh, through our Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Somebody say hallelujah. But thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And in verse 58 says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, <laughs> unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So when you get in that in the middle of nowhere, when you get in a place of uncertainty, and everything seems to be falling in around you and crashing in, you need to stand on your tippy toes and let the enemy know and speak that word of faith that God is with me, God knows what I'm going through, and I'm looking for that resurrection. I'm looking for that time where the trump of God sounds. Because the Bible says the trump of God will sound. Do you believe that today? The trump of God will sound, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Amen. And we which are alive remain are going to be caught up together to meet them in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Amen. I, I don't know, I don't know what else I can say this morning other, other than the fact. That, 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 that no matter what's going on around you right now, no matter what, in times of uncertainty, turn your face toward the Lord. Begin to pray. Seek the face of God. Put your faith, your heart, your trust, your hope in Him. Man can only go so far. Man is limited in their knowledge and their understanding. Men is even limited in their wisdom. Amen. Man's got a lot of good things. We've got a lot of smart people. But, Always understand, they are limited. God is unlimited. Amen. So begin to pray and talk to God. Put yourself in that place, no matter where you're at, and say, oh, Lord, our Lord, I might be in the middle of all this right now. Amen. But how excellent is thy name. How great are you, God. Let's stand all over this place today. Amen. And I want you to raise your hands. And if you feel comfortable, come to the altar. Just kind of give yourself some space. Amen. Put your mask on if you're comfortable with it. Come to this altar. If not, I don't want this to be a dead house today just because of, of, of mask and everything else. I'm just going to tell you straight how I feel today. Amen. We still need to lift our voice and lift our praises unto God and magnify Him because He's worthy of our praise. In the middle of time and uncertainty, we need to worship and magnify God and praise Him and lift Him up. Come on, all across the house right now. All across the house right now. Raise your hands. Worship God. Magnify Him. What, what's your situation? Let Him know what you, what you need from Him this morning. You thought I was worth saving. So yes. you came and changed my life.
Thank you. 